Hey, hello, here we are for part six of our Tiffany Aiken fan fiction. And I think we're going to finish it tonight. So this fan fiction, if you remember, is called The First Witch. And Tiffers has come up against um, an, an old crone, a witch who claims to be the first one, the queen of hell. Everything bad put into one person and last night when we were reading she um she melted some rock didn't she which was actually an old witch who had been sitting ever so long she turned to rock that's where we left it with that melted rock witch saying thank you to ash for taking away her heart because without her heart she can't feel and the reason she was sitting there in the first place was because of her feelings wasn't it so we'll pick it up from there is not a trigger warning at all, but tonight I've had a kind of flick through, and it's a little bit more adult tonight. I won't, I won't edit any of it out. Okay, so um, it, yeah, there's just like, I don't know. It's a bit, it's a bit more adult. Simple as that. But like I say, not a trigger warning. Here we go. Anyway. Taking my heart is the first piece I have felt in untold time. I, thou, hast made me a monster, and I thank thee. You are a cursed creature, Ash said, ignoring her autobiography. She held up the heart, which had metamorphosed into a large ruby the size of an eye. It glowed. Devoid of humanity, yet still a witch. In a town not far from here is another girl who has traded her soul to demons for the best of fleeting gifts mortality offers. Near where this young woman lives is a woman kept down whose chains have been broken and she has been given the means to strike back at the world as she sees fit. The Eternal Maiden. The suffering mother freed of her responsibilities and tethers imposed on her by time and by blood. And the crone, so far gone she has passed through death and back, heartless. Tiffany and the undead witch looked at each other as they both understood. Witches without limits. From what she had said at the cottage, Nancy was going to be beautiful soon. Unnaturally so, and the object of lust for many boys and men in the area. Along with her slave, which was a bad example all on its own. Lanka did not approve of slavery, being stubborn and prideful people. How did you free a slave who chose to be one? Most of the locals had been told about democracy and laughed the idea off as a king trying to get people to do his job. Besides, put three random people in a room together and while they personally were sure they could make the right choices for other people, they would never believe it of nearly anyone else who might be in the room. And, what was more, she had made it clear that she was not a threat to the virtue of any young men, but the local parents might have something to say to Nancy involving their daughters. Tiffany could only imagine what her mother would say if one of her sisters had run off or just run around with a girl. They'd have been having talks about Tiffany potentially never getting married at all. All those other daughters and a son, then they were still staying up at night concerned she would never have any children. They still disliked that Tiffany lived separate from her, him in her little cottage. And even if Nancy did not actually do anything with a specific girl, it was easy to guess one of them, or a boy, might see her walking out with someone else and decide to date another girl, if another, or if a boy, another male. Tiffany would like to think people would do it just because they wanted to, not because they mimicked each other, but she was standing there in a black dress and a pointy hat, a unique and one-off kind of outfit, just like all the other witches. She remembered when she was starting out and got all the witch gear to impress the other girls. Nancy was rather that kind of girl, that kind of witch. Girls would want to copy her and press. Tiffany, meanwhile, was the responsible type parents would come to in order to complain and try to fix things. Personally, Tiffany had no problem with same-gender couples perfectly natural after all sheep did it all the time it wasn't her cup of tea but they said dwarves traditionally had a hard time telling one another apart and they managed to love one another just fine 
Nobody had ever dared accuse Tiffany of playing the field or having secret lovers, which was a bit insulting. The concept of a witch indulging in all of that loving was hardly new, and with Nanny Og living not too far away, it was not exactly an old wives' tale, so much as a regular complaint. Nobody had ever suggested Tiffany might like girls either, and admittedly, as the local witch, she knew one or two local girls who did indulge in that sort of thing, including witches. She doubted Nancy would have would use a love potion for herself, but she seemed like the type to step into Nanny Og's shoes. The kind who the kind she wore to tease boys and then trip over a route when they chased her, only she would be doing it to the girls, and of course, being a witch on her own, they would be complaining to Tiffany. A lot of complaining, she thought. Nanny Og had for Nanny Og had gotten a few about Grebo and Tiffany just realised the girl had a similar eye to his. Coincidence? Or was Ash right about fate? Nobody liked to say it, but there were naughty boys and girls among the most homegrown of farmers. People who did stuff you did not mention in front of the kids lest they take up the idea. The real way they expected young people to control themselves was for one or both of them to be too ignorant or embarrassed to actually do anything, even if the other pushed. When they were both ignorant, well, that was how Amber was conceived potentially with a passing stranger. If they were both naughty people first and they got the idea, they might stick together, but... If they did not, there was a problem. You could marry somebody they disapproved of, but running around popping out babies or just ruining other girls' reputations, that got people's dander up. Nancy would confuse things. No babies. Or perhaps there might be. Magic babies? People would wonder whether it happened or not. As for Mrs Petty, she may have committed one murder and gotten away with it, but how long until another? Would another lover treat her badly and die? Someone might cut her off in the market and steal a ripe potato, steal a ripe tomato she wanted and keel over, or poof, instant frog and roommate for Tiffany's lawyer. She remembered the nervous woman, scared, beaten, yet terrified at Tiffany's power, even though it was actually the Feagles doing the chores. A sight that would possibly have made anyone familiar with a Feagle believe Ash's claims of Tiffany's divinity. She wasn't a terribly bright person either. That was a problem because, as wizards and witches hated when people pointed out, you did not need to be that smart to use magic. But to use it properly. Hmm. Being helpless and stupid, then suddenly having superhuman abilities, was a recipe for disaster. Sudden freedom was a heady thing, and Tiffany knew enough history to know what slaves normally did to their captors when their chains were broken and the whips knocked from their hands. Ash's words rang in her head, things about bars and cages not being made of metal, but thought. Mistress Petty might consider herself free with her husband's death, her fault or not, or she might take a look around. The daughter who caused a rift in her marriage. The people who let it happen. Tiffany's own father had admitted they let things go too far when Amber lost the baby. And now this. A heartless undead with clearly happy with itself. Flesh filling out and looking younger by the minute, but still black and monstrous. A crone, even if it was no longer mummified, twisted by heartbreak, devoid of humanity, but still instilled with power and thought. She looked at Ash. No wonder she felt no need to stick around. She had a replacement, and one that might be there a thousand years when Ash completed her circuit of the disc. Did she crave blood? Tiffany almost hoped she did. It would be a connection at least. Vampires and werewolves could be quite sociable. There was a great circle of life there. Even lions would drink from the same water as a gazelle. Being isolated from that, well, witches watched each other for a reason. They were often isolated too, even in a crowded room, wherever she was. What's your name? Tiffany asked suddenly. It blinked slowly. Uh, uh, It was Marissa. Tiffany stepped forward and hugged her. I'm sorry you were hurt, Marissa. I bet nobody else understood you, did they? They probably said you should give up being a witch to be happy with your young man, or that your young man was worthless and you should choose power, like it was so easy. And you were a witch. You should have been able to do anything, to have what you wanted, whatever it was. Tiffany stepped back with tears in her eyes. Nobody 
Gods above, nobody came for you, did they? You walked up to this cave, a place you knew and came often to think, but everyone just left you here, didn't they? Marissa flinched, clutching at the hole in her chest. It was almost gone. I... Tiffany turned and snatched the stone from Ash's hand. She didn't look surprised. Instead, she smiled, and Tiffany realised she was not in control. There had been no spill words before. Now they rang out, while Marissa held the hole in her chest. You're very, very good at this, aren't you? Nothing disappointed or angry came through. It was just one more interesting thing in a long, long life. She didn't say it out loud, and the unspoken words vanished when Marissa looked up. Keep it away! She said, hissing at the stone like a vampire with holy symbols. I can still feel it. Tiffany did. I will, but not forever. Come on, I'll walk you down to town. I'm sure somebody's going to have a place for you. Actually, I think Queen Magrat's going to let you stay at the castle. Me? me? She said, shocked. Suddenly the attitude she had towards her monstrous appearance and nudity turned to bashfulness. Tiffany smiled. It seemed kind, but anyone who knew the royal couple might have noticed a bit of mischief. Magra and the king, not to mention their children, were almost supernaturally nice and helpful. Morning people. A bit naive. Marissa was in for an all-day cheerful welcome by the ro local royal family. She was not sure what life was like in Lankra hundreds of years ago, but generally speaking, history books were pretty certain it was a harsh time, with vicious people... For, but, no, for nobility fighting all the time. The old king had, by all accounts, been fairly likely to kill any peasants who crossed him and take their women for his own pleasure, and he was one of the low-key rulers. The current bunch would confuse even a heartless monster with well-meaning clumsy kindness. Plus, Magrat was a witch and a mother, a mean combination if he became a threat to her children. Just in case, Tiffany remembered the Baron's dog, a sheep killer, and how her granny had put it in a barn with the mother sheep and her lamb, and by the time they let it out, the dog had become a quivering mess of badly beaten mush that jumped if you said ba. As for the others, well, Tiffany knew the mother of old, and her daughter. With her husband out of the way, it might be time to get some grandkids involved and the community. She should make everyone aware that Miss Petty was a witch and let them get scared before she actually did anything like a proper witch. Do like she had with Anna Grammer. Drunk with power, the woman would not take kindly to being taught, but she also was not really aware of what she was doing. Not yet. Tiffany supposed the best way was not to tell her what to do, but to show her how to do it. She was a mother and had raised Amber. That was a way in. With her own mother, if she wanted help doing something, she asked for it, even if she knew better how to do it and her mother was not actually sure what to do. Tiffany, for example, was good with cheese and had branched out to some before she had seen in the city that the chalk had never been heard of before. Mother, could you help me make this genuine, genuine purple-veined wheel? Can you help me figure out what I'm doing wrong with this slice of 4 and beer brie? Then she made the cheese, letting her mother observed to make sure she was doing it right, making sure she did every step right and true and explained it all as if she was making sure she was doing it right even though they both knew the elder Aiken was completely clueless. Done right, she could get the whole town fearful and respectful of Miss Petty, reunite their family and check in regularly by coming by to ask the elder witch for advice and help. The not-at-all-head-witch asking her for advice? The woman would probably strut or trip and fall into a bush whilst trying to strut. Nancy would be difficult. Hmm. Her family hated her and she had murdered her father cheerfully. She had stolen the house and had demons whispering in her ear. She was their priestess. Also, she had no soul. Or at least someone else had a lean on it. And it was Ash's personal student. Being undead was one thing, but Ash herself was a model of how immortals with no consequences for their actions could turn on, turn out. She had already been live through a living hell and needed little from others. Still, there was a hold there. She had taken a house, was seated in the centre of a town. If she was too much of a problem, she would be driven out, either by the people or by the witches. None of this wicked trio could ever be fully trusted. But Tiffany could get her hooks in them, and she intended to treat them as people, not monsters. Her instincts told her that the surest way for someone to become an unspeakable horror was to treat them like they were one already. 
or to go too far the other way and be overly sympathetic. It was a balancing act. Fortunately, the Ramtops had a long history of treating everyone the same, mostly friendly with a touch of indifference. You're a troll, a dwarf, a vampire? Who cares? Maybe you do, but as long as you keep yourself to yourself, know anything about whatever it is. If not, clear off. It would not be that easy, she was sure, but like Ash had pointed out, she was a very, very old school witch. Tiffany might not have her experience, but she knew the new ways. No matter how skilled someone was with a hoe cobbled together from a rock, a few straps of leather and a whip, they still couldn't beat a modern blow. The mail coach could not defeat the railway for speed. Witches had stopped being wicked and evil and moved on to the nasty, but good for a reason – and it was up to her to prove she had the better system. Mm -hmm. Right, here's what I'm going to do, because otherwise we've got another le episode the same length here, but I'm determined to finish it tonight. So I'm going to call this number six, part one, and I'm now about to record number six, part two, which will be the finale. All right? So I'll see you in a minute or two. All right? not trying to confuse things here just trying to keep episode lengths to a sensible length otherwise you'll all be falling asleep won't you we don't want that all right i'll see you in a bit adios